God, you are my God. I seek you. My flesh thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. These are the first five verses of Psalm 63. And if we were to give it a, a Jane Austen type of title, we might call this psalm Senses and Spirituality. Now, I'm not sure how many of you get that joke, but I know there's at least a few literary folks out there. But nonetheless, the point is this. These five verses reach toward all five senses to communicate the depth of spiritual longing and experience. You see, in verse 1, there's the feeling of thirst as flesh faints. In verse 2, there's sight in the sanctuary. In verses 3 and 4, there's the sound of praise and calling on God's name. And then in verse 5, there is the smell and the taste of a rich feast. Right? You see, all five senses are involved in worshiping God, and this isn't even necessarily meant to be metaphorical. This is actually a very literal description of what ancient Jewish worship was like. You know, there was the beautiful sight of the temple, and then the sound of praises being sung, uh, the scent of sacrifices being offered. All of these things are, are parts of their worship. God meets his people in their senses. God meets us in our senses. And this is something I want to spend some time considering together. You know, so, so last week we took a, a, a look at the big picture of the body and the whole biblical story. And we saw that in creation, God made us with physical bodies. And then in the fall, our bodies began to experience pain and death. But in the ultimate act of redemption, Jesus was resurrected with a physical body that could be seen and touched and could even sit down to cook and eat breakfast with his disciples. In these weeks following Easter, the celebration of that resurrection, and also during this season of our own social and physical distancing, right, I want to continue focusing on the ways that God meets us in and through our physical bodies. And the way that I want to do that is by considering each of the five senses. And so for each one of these, over the next few weeks, we will look at the places where that sense occurs in Scripture, and particularly in Jesus' life and ministry. And then also consider some ways that we might experience God through that very sense. All right, and so this week, I want to begin with the sense of touch. All right, this is a sense that I'm sure we're all a little bit less in touch with due to this time of, of being apart, this time of distancing. But I begin with touch because it really is a, a primary sense. You know, for all of the others, sight, sound, taste, and scent, there are specific body parts that correlate, right? The eyes and ears and mouth and nose. Uh, but for the sense of touch, the sense of feeling, there is not just one body part, but rather the whole body is involved. You know, our skin is the largest organ of our body. It makes up somewhere around 10% of your body weight. But our sense of feeling goes beyond just our skin, right? If you've ever had a stomach ache, or if you've ever felt sore after working out or, or being active, you know that our, our sense of feeling goes deeper than skin. You know, so our feeling, our sense of feeling and touch, it, it's a primary sense. It's also the very first sense 
that develops. Within the first month of pregnancy, the nervous system has already begun to develop in the baby and can respond to these sort of feeling and touch sensations within the womb. After about two months of, of development, uh, skin has begun to form and develop and, and can feel. And then by about halfway through a pregnancy, a baby can fully feel touch and, and temperature, right? And respond to these things. Fortunately, the baby is nice and warm inside of their mother, right? And then after birth, touch continues to be a primary sense, as it is how the baby knows if they're hungry and need to be fed or if they're dirty and need to be cleaned. Uh, and physical contact is essential for the healthy growth of newborns. Babies who are born prematurely with need of further hospitalization and incubation end up being distanced from their mothers and experiencing some measure of sensory neglect. But some time ago, hospitals began giving these newborns regular massages because studies have shown that massaged babies gain weight and, and grow as much as 50% faster than unmassaged babies. You know, and furthermore, the babies who experienced this sensory stimulation regularly from their earliest days grew to be better able to calm and console themselves. They were less irritable. They slept better and, and generally grew to have better mental health. And then even beyond infancy, touch continues to be an important sense. Right? Did any of you or your children or grandchildren have a favorite stuffed animal or a special blanket right? that, was the, that you had as a child or they have as a child? This tangible object that you can hold and, and snuggle with, right? it is this important part of growing up, a, an important part of development. And even into adulthood, touch remains vitally important. Various studies have shown that everyone needs a certain number of loving physical touches every day to maintain good mental health. And this may be why many of us are finding ourselves a bit more irritable or depressed or, or down after over a month of social distancing now, right? And the sense of feeling is such a primary thing that it has even worked its way into the vocabulary of our self-understanding. Because we don't simply ask each other about what we are feeling, but we ask each other, how are you feeling? Which is, which is a question that goes deeper. It's a question about our whole state of being, right? Whenever we experience something that was particularly moving, we might say that it touched us, right? Or if someone is being irritable, we might say that they're being a little touchy. So touch and feeling has come to be not only how we express physical senses, but also our emotional senses. After all, we call our emotions feelings, don't we? And we experience them as that physical sensation of a lump in the throat or butterflies in our stomach or a balloon in our chest. You know what I'm talking about, right? So touch is this important thing for, for our physical health and our mental health, but it's also significant in our spiritual life as well. In the Bible, both Old and New Testaments uh, talk about the laying on of hands as this powerful sign of blessing and prayer and intercession. And not only can touching be a sign of blessing, uh, not touching can act as a warning. Right, long before any kind of scientific understanding of viruses or bacteria, the book of Leviticus had detailed instructions for what essentially amounted to social distancing. 
in the case of various diseases and health issues. So Leviticus 13 and 14 discusses leprosy and various skin diseases. And then Leviticus 15 gets even more personal by discussing various kinds of bodily discharges that, that might happen both for men and for women. And so for each case, whether it's a disease on the skin or a discharge from somewhere else, a person would be considered unclean while they were in this condition. And an unclean person had to keep their distance from others. And anyone who came into contact, not only with an unclean person, but with anything that an unclean person had touched, that person would, would also become unclean. And so then, after their condition cleared up, the unclean person would go to the temple, present themselves to the priest, offer a sacrifice, and then wash themselves and be made clean again. Now, does any of this kind of stuff feel familiar in the midst of this season that we're in? I mean, we go to the grocery store and we keep our distance from other people. And any shopping cart that's been touched by another person needs to be thoroughly wiped down and cleansed before we're willing to use it ourselves. And right when we get back home, we need to wash ourselves down, right? This is our own process of purification, process of cleansing. Suddenly, the book of Leviticus is very relevant, right? But all of this is to say that touch is very important uh, in the Bible. And in light of all of this, the sense of touch is also particularly striking in Jesus' ministry. And that's what I want to focus in on today. So go ahead and grab your Bible and open up to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse 40. And, and I want to look at a couple of stories from Jesus' ministry today. Uh, and, and so this is where we're starting. Jesus begins his ministry proclaiming the kingdom of God has come near. And everything else that he says and does is a depiction of what this kingdom of God looks like. But in our passage today, we're going to see that the kingdom of God is not only something to be seen or heard about, but actually something to touch and to be touched by. So Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 40. Hear the word of the Lord. A leper came to him, begging him, and kneeling, and said to him, If you choose, you can make me clean. So moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I do choose. Be made clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into any town openly, but stayed out in the country. And people came to him from every quarter. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the gift of touch and feeling. I pray that as we consider the words of your scripture, that you would sharpen our minds and soften our hearts, that we might know you and love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this story in Mark chapter 1 is incredible and, and honestly kind of startling and shocking. So let's look at it a little bit more closely. All right, so first of all, it begins in verse 40. A leper came to him right, came to Jesus. And already in this, we can see the stigma that's associated with this condition. 
You see, it could have said a man with leprosy, at least acknowledging the humanity of him before naming the disease. But it doesn't say that. It just says a leper. And maybe this is just a succinct narrative description, but it is exactly how this man would have been viewed in the ancient world. You see, in that world, he, he really was not a man. He was simply a leper. He was not a suffering human, but rather a danger to be avoided. Because to come into contact with a leper would not only risk your physical health, but also your spiritual cleanliness. To come into contact with a leper is to become unclean. So lepers lived in constant social isolation. They were not allowed into towns or cities, and they would uh, had to keep their distance from anyone that they came across. And then the term used in the Bible that's translated leprosy or leper it can actually refer to a number of different kinds of skin diseases. But the modern day Hansen's disease, which is traditionally what we think of when we think of leprosy, is a prime example of what the Bible might be referring to in this term. And there was a doctor named Paul Brand who worked extensively with leprosy patients in the 20th century. And he wrote about his experiences. And he wrote, he hates leprosy because more than just about anything else, it cuts people off from others. And his understanding is that it not only cuts people off from the touch of other people, and isolates them, it also cuts them off from their own sense of touch. This is the way he describes it. The disease slowly silences nerve sensors on the hands and feet until the afflicted lose the ability to sense touch. He describes that many of the lesions that leprosy patients have are not a direct cause of the disease, but rather a symptom of not being able to feel or sense pain. So they cannot tell that the water is too hot, and so they burn themselves and blisters begin to form. Or they cannot tell that, that their shoes or sandals are on too tight, so it ends up rubbing their skin raw. According to Dr. Brand, leprosy is to skin, but blindness is to eyes, or deafness is to ears. It is a loss of the sense of touch. An important sense that, and because touch is so primary, as we've already discussed, that, that ends up leading to this sort of self-destruction because they can't even feel their own pain. So back to the text. All right, this leprous man covered in blisters and blemishes against all social practices and religious laws. This man approaches Jesus, and he throws himself at Jesus' feet. And how does Jesus respond? How does Jesus respond to this man? I mean, imagine yourself again walking through the grocery store, and someone walks right up to you, right? They just totally ignore the six feet they're supposed to stay away. They don't have a mask on. They just throw themselves in your face. How are you going to respond to that? How are you going to feel? Are you going to be frustrated? Annoyed? Angry? Maybe you're worried that you might catch some kind of thing. You know, you might be vulnerable to this virus. Jesus has every right to respond one of these ways. But if you look at verse 41, it says, Jesus is moved with pity. Jesus is not annoyed. He is not frustrated or worried but rather, Jesus is deeply moved by this man who is before him. And the word here translated pity is literally the Greek word for the stomach, for the guts. And so you could translate this, Jesus felt a pit in his stomach. It's a description of that ache of sorrow that you feel. Now, another possible translation of this verse is, uh, you, and you might see it in your own translation of the Bible or in the footnotes, is that Jesus is moved with anger. 
And if that's the right way to translate this, then it is clear from what follows that his anger is not toward the man, but directly toward the disease itself. Jesus is angry that the good creation has been infected with pain and suffering that leads to outcasts and isolation, right? So if you are experiencing pain in your own body, Jesus is angry about that. He's angry about the pain and the suffering that we experience in our own bodies. And so out of this righteous anger and deep compassion, Jesus responds. And what he does is shocking and startling, right? Verse 41, moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. He what? He touched him. By doing this, Jesus risks contracting the skin disease himself. And according to Leviticus, Jesus would now also become unclean because he has come into contact with a leprous person. I mean, couldn't he have just spoken the word out loud and, and healed the man from that safe six feet away without risking his physical or spiritual health? Yes, right? Jesus could have done that, but he didn't. Because the good news of the kingdom is not just something to hear or see, but rather something to touch and be touched by. And look at what happens in verse 42. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was made clean. You see, by doing this, Jesus shows that the kingdom of God in the kingdom of God, impurity does not infect what is pure, but rather it goes the other way around. Jesus' purity cleanses all that has been made unclean. And this is not just some spiritual truth as we see here. It is a physical reality. Be made clean are the words on Jesus' mouth and the touch from Jesus' hand, and he was made clean. Now, I want to look at one more story of touch from Jesus' ministry. So flip over a page or two to Mark chapter 5. All right, Mark chapter 5, and we'll begin reading in verse 25. All right, so Mark 5, verse 25. This is another story of touch in the kingdom of God. It says, now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. And immediately... Her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowds pressing in on you. Who can say, or how can you say, who touched me? And he looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now, once more, Think back to Leviticus, right? We have someone who is considered unclean here. And the leper had no way of hiding his condition because it was all over his skin. But this woman's condition was much more private. And therefore, she was able to slip into the crowd incognito, unnoticed. But by being more private, 
It was also more personal. And undoubtedly, she carried a great deal of shame that no one else could possibly know she was carrying. So she has made her way through this dense crowd, and maybe the story of the leper had spread. So, you know, she knew Jesus' touch was able to bring healing. And whatever the case, she is making her way toward Jesus. And she's reaching out for him, right? She says, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. And just like the leprous man, once she touches Jesus, in chapter 5, verse 29, it says, immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And then again, I want to ask, how does Jesus respond? How does he respond here? Well, he, he looks around the crowd and he asks, who touched me? Who touched me? And at first, we can't quite tell what tone Jesus is asking this with. Like with the leper, by coming in touch with this woman, Jesus would have been made unclean. So is he angry and annoyed? You know, how dare such a person approach him and defile him? Well, apparently she can't tell what his tone is either. Because when she comes forward in response to his question... It is with fear and trembling. But as Jesus responds to her, his tone becomes clear. He says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Once again, he is not angry with her but rather filled with compassion as he offers her a peace that she has not had for years. And once again, we see the direction of cleanliness has been reversed. Jesus is not made unclean, but rather she has been healed. In the kingdom of God, impurity does not infect the pure, but quite the other way around. And so just like we asked, well, why did Jesus reach out to touch the leper? I, I got to ask here, why did Jesus ask her to come forward? I mean, she had already been healed, right? Couldn't he have let her go her way anonymously? A and he could have. He could have done that. But if he had, it would have failed to show the way of the kingdom. Because no one is anonymous, in the kingdom of God. God knows every one of his people. Or to put it another way, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. This is how Jesus described the kingdom. And the good shepherd doesn't just snap his fingers to bring back the one sheep who had strayed. Rather, he goes out to personally find the sheep and bring it back. This is the way of the kingdom. Jesus calls the woman forward because the kingdom of God is personal. Jesus reaches out his hand toward the man because the kingdom of God is known through touch. So as we draw to a close, I want to ask one more question. How does Jesus touch us? Right? How have we been touched by the kingdom of God? Well, to think about this question, I want to bring you to one more text. All right? So flip over to Titus chapter 3. All right? This is going to be closer toward the end. Titus chapter 3, verse Four. It reads, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This Spirit He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 
when we come to faith in Jesus, one of the ways the church has always marked this moment is with the waters of baptism, right? That's what that text just said, the waters of rebirth, the, the washing of rebirth. It is a sign. Baptism is a sign of rebirth. It's just like those newborns we talked about at the beginning who emerge from the watery place of the womb into life. Baptism is also a sign of joining in the death and the resurrection of Jesus as we are buried in the water and then raised up from it. But in addition to the signs and the symbols and all of the meanings in baptism, baptism is also a very literal moment of being touched, right? Every inch of our skin is touched by the waters of baptism. And I believe that in this moment, we are not only being touched by water, but rather by Jesus himself. So I want to invite you to remember your baptism, right? If you've been baptized, can you remember that moment? What was it like? Who baptized you? Who else was there? What did the water feel like as it went over your skin, right? And as you recall this moment, remember that this was a moment when you were touched by Jesus. And if you have not been baptized, well, then I'd love to talk to you about it. You know, I don't know exactly what that looks like in this season of social distancing, but I'm sure we can figure something out, right? Uh, So if baptism is something you are are interested in, I I would love to talk with you about that and, and figure out a way forward. You know, this is a way that you can experience the touch of Jesus in the Christian community. And not only baptism, all right, but another way that this passage in Titus chapter 3 says that we have been touched by Jesus is through the Holy Spirit. It continues that water language. And in verse 6, it says that this Spirit was poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. This language is used in the Old and the New Testaments to talk about the Spirit poured out on us like water. And just like the leper, we, when we are touched by the Spirit, our dirty hearts are made clean. Just like the woman, when the Spirit is poured out on us, all of the shame that we are carrying can be healed. This is how Jesus continues to touch us today through the waters of baptism and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So my prayer for you this week is this. May you remember the waters of baptism May you live in the fullness of the Spirit, and may you feel the touch of the kingdom of God. Amen.